Good morning, Eagle Heights. Hey, if you were a host home family, uh, you can sleep during church. You have complete and total permission. Lay down in the pew. No one will bother you. Matter of fact, if some of those people are homo and they go to sleep next to you, just rub their feet. They deserve it. You don't even understand if you've never done it. I mean, listen, if God calls you to go to Africa, go, baby. Sell the house. Go. If God calls you to be a host home, pray for three days, fast for a week, and then maybe, maybe not. I'm just telling you, uh, it's brave souls that do that. It really is. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Nola. Matt, I've never seen Matt look that tired. I leaned over to Matt. I, Nola said, did he get drunk before church or did he, what's going on? He goes, he's exhausted. So <clears throat> thank you, Matt. I know you're tired. And guys, thank you so much, Eagle Heights, for your love and having this. We're going to continue studying what really matters. <clears throat> guys, I need you to pray for me. I have been fighting illness all week, so we're going to get through this morning the best we can, uh, and hopefully we have no problems, but we're continuing to examine what Solomon, or look at what Solomon was examining. Remember, we were born thirsty. That's how we were all born. We automatically like to dig our own wells instead of going to Christ, and we began to look at the sources of this, this life provides. Solomon's examining them all to see if they actually quench our thirst, if they satisfy us. And last week, we started talking about enjoyment, pleasure. Uh, can pleasure truly satisfy you? And we talked about that, and we learned that, that God does want us to experience pleasure. We learned something very important about God. He's here to enrich us, not rob us. But there's boundaries to that. And outside those boundaries, there is no real pleasure. We won't find it. It has to be able to come in God's standard. But today we're going to go to the next step, and we're going to look at employment. We're going to look at employment. And we're going to understand is, can work satisfy you? Now, I need to tell you something. Believe it or not, work was designed by God. It was actually given to man as a gift. Now, I know you may not think of it that way. Thinking of your job as a gift it seems almost foreign. It's almost like what we have to do but when you look back at Genesis chapter 2, right after God creates Adam, he does something incredible. <clears throat> he puts him in the garden, and he is told to tend the garden, and he's tended to cultivate the garden. He is to work in the garden. Now, remember I told you that you were created for relationship. That's what that thirst is. And that means you need someone who's stronger than you, who's bigger than your weaknesses. You need someone who wants to give to you and needs nothing from you, which is God giving us grace and strength. And you need someone to give us purpose that is bigger than us. Our work has to matter. Well, he did that with Adam. Immediately, he's given the task of naming the cattle and naming all the birds in the air. The fowls that were flying, it says in Scripture, he didn't name all the animals, but he was responsible for that section of naming. So he had this incredibly important task that God gave him. So God gave us work as a gift. It's there to us to enjoy it. It is there for a very specific purpose, and it is necessary. It's something that we desperately need. However, when sin entered the world, work was changed. Work took a different turn. Matter of fact, we see the punishment being set down to remind man that sin's in the world and the effect of it. When he got to Eve, he said, Eve, you will now discover pain in labor. Meaning as you give children, it will be painful to remind you that sin entered the world through your actions. But when he came to Adam, he said, you will have pain in your labor too. Every day you will toil with the earth. You will turn the earth and you will have to create and produce your own food. And as you turn that earth, it's a constant reminder that from the dust you came and to the dust you're going back. A consistent picture of sin. But that word that I just said was added to work, which was toil. Toil. Toil got brought in. Work was now going to have a difficult element to it. But understand something. It still does not eliminate the gift of work. But what we have to realize, we must understand the role work has in our life, why God gave it to us, and what it's there for. 
It has a lot of purposes. We're going to look just from Solomon's viewpoint, not from this entire scope of work, but just what Solomon's coming to, because Solomon's asking a simple question. Can work, can employment satisfy my thirst? So what is he doing? He's putting that to the test. So let's read Ecclesiastes 2, starting in verse 4. If you don't have your notes, turn in your Bibles. Or grab your notes really quick. I, being Solomon, verse 4, undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves. I had other slaves who were born in my house. I owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women, singers, and a harem as well, the delights of the hearts of men. I became great by far more, uh, by far than anyone else in Jerusalem before me. And in all this, my wisdom stayed with me. Let's just stop right there. Now, now notice what Solomon's doing. He's testing work. Now, he's putting it to the test. He's asking, can this satisfy? So let's look at his conclusion. Let's start by going back to verse 4. And notice he tells us very quickly what he's doing. He said, let me tell you what I'm doing. We're going to look at why in a minute. We need to understand what before. I undertook great projects. I undertook great projects projects. Now, understand what Solomon is doing here. That word great means that he's taking on superhuman, not meaning he's got superhuman powers, but he's going beyond anyone else has ever gone on. I'm going above and beyond what anyone else has ever done. I am enlarging my projects. So much so I'm putting more effort, I'm putting more money, I'm putting more people, I'm putting more time into these things. He goes, and when you look at it, I will have accomplished more than any king, patriarch, before me in the nation of Israel. He said, to this point, no one is going to try to do what I've done. And if you look around me, no one around me, no other nation, no other king is going to do what I have accomplished. He said, I'm getting ready to attempt something that has never been attempted before. Matter of fact, in the fourth year of his reign, he started building. And for the next 36 years, because he reigned for 40 years, he was constantly, constantly building. Matter of fact, he lists in this section what he did. He sees very clearly and details what he's done. He starts out in in verse 4 saying, I built. Well, we know he built temples. He built palaces. We know he built cities. He built stables. The temple alone, and I'm not going to go into each one. It'll take too long. We could spend days just looking at what he built. But the temple alone took 20 years because it was the temple and the palace together. It cost over $200 billion. We know that it took over 160,000 people. And if you start looking at the tons of gold, the amount of cedar, it's just, it's just limitless. This was a project that no one before him had ever even attempted or tried. This was unique to everything he's done. But he also built a palace for his first wife. He built palaces all over Jerusalem. He fortified cities. He built stables. He consistently and constantly built. But then at the end of that, he said, what else? I planted. He planted vineyards. He planted fruit trees. Then he goes on to say that he made. He made what? He made reservoirs to water the groves of gardens that he planted, of fruit trees that he planted. He built parks. He built ponds. He built detailed, intricate irrigation systems, constantly making. Then he goes on to say, I bought. He bought slaves. And then he also bought more herds than anyone else around him or anyone else before him. But then we get to verse 8, and he says this, I amass. Some of your verses will say collect. Now, this is an incredible word because it actually carries the idea of a private collection. It actually means a peculiar treasure. It's the exact same word God uses to describe the nation of Israel and the Christian, that we are a peculiar people. They are a peculiar nation. Now, the word peculiar to us means weird. If someone walks by and goes, that dude's peculiar. We don't really use it that anymore. We just say weird. It doesn't mean that. It actually means 
precious. It's a, it's a dot with a circle around it. It's highlighted. It's precious. So understand, I amassed personally a precious treasure. He is, you see Solomon going out l- like a collector, and he's collecting all of these things. Christy and I got our, our credit card hacked uh, back last year, and someone bought $7,000 worth of Star Trek collectibles. And I'm like going, dude, if you're going to rob me, at least spend it on Star Wars. What are you doing? But, uh, w- but that's it. People collect all kinds of things. And here we see Solomon collecting. So Solomon has done all of this. He said, look, here are my projects. That's what he did. But we need to look at Solomon's purpose. Why did he do it? It's not just that he did it. There's actually a why in there. Go back to verse 5. Believe it or not, we're going to see it in one of these words. Look what he said. I made gardens and I made parks. Now stop right there. That word park is a unique word because it is actually a Persian word that's been borrowed and brought into the Hebrew. And it actually means an enclosed park. Now we get our word paradise from it. And in that word, we begin to see what Solomon's trying to accomplish. See, as Solomon's building, he's looking around, and notice what the king is trying to do. The king is trying to transform his entire environment. And he's trying to discover, can I create something that's going to bring lasting satisfaction and permanent enjoyment? Now, the last place he could find that was where? In the Garden of Eden. And the only person who ever accomplished it was God. So what is Solomon doing? I believe Solomon is mimicking, not claiming to be God, but mimicking what God did. And he's trying in the midst of his environment to create this paradise. We see him planting fruit trees, trees, gardens. It's enclosed. Then he's getting people to populate it. He's creating this paradise. And that's his purpose. He's trying to create a place that permanently provides satisfaction, enjoyment, rest, peace. And then he comes to the end of that situation. He finishes his task after transforming it all, and we see his perceptions. Look at his perceptions of what he says. Notice what he says at the very end of this. Verse 9, I became greater. Now, understand he's not bragging. What that means is I did it. Everything I set out to do, I accomplished. I built these cities. I built all my projects. I finished them all. In other words, I created a paradise. I created an unseen, unbelievable paradise like no one else before me. But notice what he said about that paradise. Verse 10, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was my reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Chasing after the wind, I had no profit under the sun. Remember, it's all under the sun. He's looking at it from an earthly perspective. Remember what meaningless meant? Meaningless means empty. Warren Wiersbe defines it better than anyone else I've ever seen. It's what less, what is left after a bubble pops. I, I went to a wedding and they didn't throw rice. They blew bubbles. And they were blowing bubbles on the bride and groom as they left. And they're just popping and going out. He goes, that's what meaningless is. Once that bubble goes created and then it pops, what is left over is what is meaningless. There's nothing. But then we saw chasing after the wind last week, meaning it's something permanent trying to grab onto something impermanent. You're constantly trying to grab something there. And notice what he's saying, guys, and I need you to stop and just step into this with me. Notice what he's telling us. That utopia does not, cannot, will never exist on this earth. That's why politics fails. Because politics never considers the most important part of the question, and that is this. Man cannot control his environment and create sustainability and enjoyment and permanent change. Everything we do in this world is from an external perspective. I'm trying to control the outside so I can manage the inside. Jesus, or Solomon, right here, and Jesus agrees, backs that up, teaches the same thing. That contentment, satisfaction is an internal issue, not an external one. 
That's why throwing money at a problem won't necessarily work. That's why changing the situation won't necessarily work. Solomon is telling me, I created a paradise. I created a perfect environment. And guess what? I was no more satisfied than I was before. Hey guys, listen to me. Your job is not there for you to create the house of your dreams and and to have the life you've always dreamed of. You're not slaving away so you can then enjoy life. Because I can tell you whatever life you create, I don't care where it is, whether it's on the beach or in the mountains or in an RV, God bless you people. I, I don't know what that's for your dream is, but once you get there, you will be no more satisfied than you were when you were working because your circumstances do not provide that. We're not talking about that today, but that's one of the side notes that Solomon teaches us from this lesson. But he does teach us two things about work here. Look what he says in verse 10. Verse 10 is very important. We learn two very important words, guys. This relates to work. There's the word doing, and there's the word done. He talks about doing the project, and he talks about it when he's done with the project. Now, notice what he said at the end of verse 10. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was my reward for my labor. Let me read it to you this way. My heart found delight in doing the work. Notice what he said. Work is there to bring enjoyment. Work was designed for us to enjoy it. Matter of fact, there's enjoyment associated with work. It's a part of it. The task that is before you, accomplishing it, getting it done, it is to be enjoyed. But then he says something else. That's doing the work. But notice what he said, what happens when the work is done. But when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I told to achieve, it was meaningless. Meaning, the enjoyment was only during the work. It wasn't after. The enjoyment I can expect is as I labor, as I work, as I function. It's not after it. Work was never intended to be an end and of itself. It has a very specific purpose, and it cannot satisfy your thirst. But we learned something from this, from the employment test, and that is this. We're to enjoy it. He wants you to enjoy work. But the question becomes is, how do we enjoy work? Well, actually, Solomon actually gives us steps to enjoyment. And notice where it begins. And we're going to step into other parts of Ecclesiastes. But notice where it begins. It begins with a heart of contentment. It begins with a heart of contentment. When Solomon gets to chapter 3, he's examining life. And here's what he came to. He said, there are so many inconsistencies. There are so many things I cannot explain. He said, I feel like all I'm doing is enduring life. Now, Now remember, he has two perspectives. Under the sun under the sun, and then above the heavens. One is looking from earthly perspective, man's wisdom. The other is looking at it from God's perspective. And in this verse, we see him shift quickly. And he said, as I look at the earth, he said, I see all these things. He says, and he gives examples. One is injustice. He looks at how come the rich get off with crime and and, and the poor suffer for it. And he goes, it makes no sense to me. But he goes on with this. He goes, I've been trying to explain it all. And he came to this conclusion. Even though I can now explain it, and I may be able to sit back and understand it, my explanation doesn't help me actually solve the problem. So he said, understanding it doesn't create a solution. It actually makes it harder because now I see the problem and I can't fix the problem. He said, I, I've tried to live my life explaining it all, and I've realized all I'm doing is enduring life. He said, something's got to change. So he shifted his focus to above the heaven. He said, instead of me trying to endure life and explain things I can't explain, I would rather enjoy it. And he said, and that begins with a heart of contentment. So I saw that there's nothing better for man than to enjoy his work because that is his lot. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Now, if he's going to define contentment, it's to accept your lot in life. Paul would say it differently, to accept that your life is in God's hands and is coming from God. It starts with me understanding something. I accept the situation that God is absolutely in control. And even though I don't understand it, he does. And even though I can't explain it, he can. And even though sometimes it feels like life has to be endured, it still can be enjoyed. God has it, and I don't. 
Now, now contentment comes when I come and I accept that reality. I come and I accept the reality that God is in control, but I don't have to be. Matter of fact, Paul said it this way, because the two guys who wrote most about contentment in the Bible are Solomon and Paul. Book of Philippians, all about that. Listen to what he said. Famous verse that Paul wrote as he's talking about finding contentment. He said, I have learned to be content no matter my circumstances. Ephesians, Ephesians, Philippians 4.11. Now he tells us how. Do you know what it says? It says, it says in Christ I can do all things. Ephesians 4.12. That, that verse that we use to hang on every wall that say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, every game we play, God's going to let me win. He'll give me strength to win. I'm going to build a business. God's going to give me the strength to win. Hey, whatever dream I have, God's going to give me strength to win. Has nothing to do with that. Nothing. Every time I've seen I can do all things through Christ, it's always associated with sports. Do you know what it's associated with, Paul? Contentment. Paul said, I've been rich, I've been poor, I've had much, I've had nothing, I've eaten fully, I've starved, I've been free, I've been in prison, and in all these things, I found contentment. Why? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ is in control, and I accept that life comes from Him. I can trust Him. See, we need to learn something else about God. God is in control, and I can trust Him. It is in that trust that we find contentment. It's in that trust where I don't have to explain. I don't have to endure. I can find enjoyment. And when I accept my lot in life, as Solomon says it, that God has got it, God is in control, notice what it frees me to do, to enjoy my day a day at a time. I can approach my day with joy, resting in God for my satisfaction. And notice how that changes your focus. Notice how it completely changes your focus. Instead of you seeing what you do not have, I didn't get that promotion, I didn't get that corner office, I didn't get the company truck, I didn't get the raise. You begin to see what you do have. You begin to be grateful for what you have, not what you want. It changes your entire perspective, and it does something even greater. You're free from being defined by your job. So many of us define ourselves by what we do. Ministers are the worst. Number one on the list. I can go to any minister's conference, and and you'll run into your friends, and the first thing they'll ask you goes, well, how many of you can't come into your church? Now, the only reason they ask you that is because something good's going at their church, and they want to brag about it, like they've had something to do with it. God builds churches, we don't. And they want to tell you about it. So I always do the same thing. Oh, it's horrible, man. Um, We've only got six people and we've moved into the Fellowship Hall. We're renting out our auditorium as a hay barn. We're not even using it anymore. Watch how fast they run away. They go, oh, okay, bye. Like I got the plague on me or something. Why? Because they define their role, their life by that success. So many of us define ourselves by what we do. We've spent our times learning it, committing to it, and we spent a majority of our life doing it. But when you begin to realize something, when you begin to realize that God is in control, you begin to realize that it is God who's put you in the position you did. You guys understand something? When I was called to the ministry, I wasn't called to be a pastor. I was called to serve God, to follow God. Whatever that looked like, missionary, pastor, youth pastor, Music minister, God help us all. That's what I wanted to be. I have no musical ability, can't sing, can't dance. I don't know what dancing has to do with it, but I was going to go a new direction. (laughs) But there's going to be a day when I'm done doing this, when I can't do this as well anymore. Someone younger, someone wiser, someone better than I steps into this place. But am I done with ministry? Absolutely not, because I'm called to ministry, no matter what that looks like for me, no matter what it looks like for Christy and I. I'm going to go on because I'm not defined by being a pastor. I'm defined by my God is in control, and he's asked me to do something. That means something, that when you go to work, your job doesn't define you. So if you are the CEO of your company, or you're the janitor, guess what? You can have the exact same perspective and enjoy work exactly the same. One, everybody's calling your name. The other, nobody knows your name. But guess what? You can find joy, meaning, and purpose because you are in a state of contentment. God's got this. 
I accept my lot in life. I accept that God has me here, and God has me here for a reason. Solomon began to say out, I began to accept the fact that God's in control, and I'm not, and I'm okay with that. God's in control. He has got it. See, it begins with a heart of contentment, but when it happens then, when you have that heart of contentment, you can discover that God enables you to enjoy your work. Listen to this verse, guys. This is incredible. Then I realized that it is, a, is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. We see again contentment. Hey, God's got this. This is where God has me in my life. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept this lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift from God. God. When you accept your lot in life, it opens you to do something else. God then enables you to enjoy your job. Notice something. God enables. He allows you to find enjoyment in what you do. Now, he goes on to define that. He tells us clearly what it is. What is that enjoyment? And be happy in his work. Happy in your work. That's what he tells us when he talks about enjoyment. It's not just that you're there. It's that you enjoy it. It brings something to you. But understand something. When, you, when that brings it to you, you're going to share it with every single person around you. And when you begin to see that your work is a gift from God, notice what that creates in you. Gratitude. Gratitude. I have this because God gave it to me. I'm here because God blessed me with this job. It is no longer a burden. It is now a blessing. It is no longer a task. It is now a talent that God has put in my hands and trusted me with it. I've been put in this place specifically by God. Why? Because God's in control. God's got it under control, and he has me here to bless me to bless me with enjoying this job so I can bless the people that are around me. Now, when you come to that point, it automatically says something else. You're now ready to understand that you're there for a purpose. You're there to be a witness. You're there representing Christ. You're there as Colossians 3.17 says, that whatever you do in word or deed, do it to the full extent to the glory of God. I'm where I'm at to show the love of Christ so I can share the life of Christ as the Spirit leads. But it is only when you understand that God is in control and you have contentment with that. I've got, God, this is my lot in life. God has me here. He's in control. I'm good with that. That God is able to enable you to enjoy it. That purpose is unlocked. And you can go to work with joy and happiness to bless the people that are around you. And then you're free to do something else. Look at the last point Solomon brings out in the book of of Ecclesiastes. You're then able to make the most of your opportunities. Look what he says. As making the most of your opportunities. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For the grave where you're going, there's neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. There's two things we learn. Notice the first one. Whatever you do, do it with all your might. You know, when I was a boy, my dad, and most of you, a lot of you may have had the privilege of knowing my father. Uh, he passed away this last year, and he helped actually be one of the trustees that helped found this church. And my father's my hero. He's a godly man. But my dad grew up in a Depression-era family, and he started work at seven years old dragging cotton bags to the cotton pickers. Uh, he and his whole family did. So my dad's way of relaxing, guys, was work. He planted gardens. He loved to garden. He had, I, I, at one point, my dad had four gardens across Oklahoma City, or, and more, I mean. He had one at the office, one at our house, one at a friend's house, and one at a friend's business. We were constantly going around and, and working. My dad would get off from work, eat dinner, and go out in the garden and garden and work harder. He loved gardening. I would have to turn off cartoons to watch Oklahoma gardening, which is just sick, but he'd make me do it. But I remember I worked with my dad. And my dad would, as we walked, my dad not only showed me how to work, he taught me key elements about working. And he said, son, I'm going to tell you something. There's some things I need to give you about work that you need to be prepared for. He said, it does it. there's a thing I'm going to tell you, it's not about your ability. It's not about your intelligence. And it's not about where you are in a station in life. 
Because when you walk into a room, son, there's going to be people that are smarter than you. There's going to be people who are better at this job than you. And there's going to be people who are going to want you to succeed and people are going to want you to fail. But if you do these three things, you'll be successful no matter what you do. He said, when you go to every job, you are to do number one, be the hardest worker in the room. He said, you don't have to have an education to be a hard worker. You don't have to have any type of anything other than a determination to get in there and do it harder. He goes, son, if the boss asks for 10 minutes, you give him 11. If you're to be there at nine, he goes, you better show up at 8.55. He goes, you're the first to arrive and the last to leave. Work hard. Then he said, you come with something else, a humble attitude. You don't know you're there to learn. And you can learn from everybody in that room, from the highest to the lowest. Learn learn, learn. And they said the last one that I always remember, you're there to help those around you. Davis is serve. We become better when the whole gets better. And my dad always used this. He was a state farm agent. He said, the first president of the company, the owner knew one thing to make this company successful. I had to make the agent successful. So every policy he set was to make the agent successful. And he said, when that happened, the company was, he said, that's what we're about. That's what Solomon means when he says, do it with all your might. When you go in, you pour yourself into the job. Matter of fact, when the children of Israel were going to captivity of Babylon, do you know what God told them through the prophet Jeremiah? He goes, you go to that city and you plant, you invest yourself, and he says, you pour yourself into the jobs they give you because the success of the nation of Babylon means your success. You're tied to it. Pour yourself out there. Work hard. Learn and serve those around you. That's what it means when we come. As you're a believer, you know what that means you should be? You should be the hardest worker in the room. You should be the humblest one there learning. And you should be there to help everyone else succeed. That's what it means to work hard. When you walk into your company, you should become indispensable. And when your company looks going, why is that department successful? They can circle you so that when they come and ask why, you can say one thing. Well, I have to be honest with you. It's because God has told me to. I'm under the favor of God. God's got this. I'm here for a purpose. I'm here because I enjoy my work, and I'm here to serve and work. But then he says something second here, and that's more important. Do with all your might because the grave is coming. We have a short time, just a short time, and we're coming to the end. There's coming a point when you'll grow weak. Your body won't work as, be- as well. Someone younger and stronger will take your place. And the days of being able to work are gone, and the possibility of enjoyment is no longer there. So claim it now. See, some of you today are just enduring your job. You're seeing what you don't have. You're seeing seeing it from a perspective of, I deserve instead of, I've been given this gift. A heart of contentment says, God is in control, and I accept this from you, God, as a blessing. I'm here to trust you. And then I'm coming for one reason, God. I'm asking you to help me to endure, uh, not endure, but enjoy. I want a purpose that when I go to that job, I'm enjoying it and I'm representing you and it's obvious. And then Lord, I'm going to pour myself out serving you for your glory because you asked me to. If you adjust your focus on that, you will begin to enjoy work and you'll find the purpose just like God handed Adam a purpose that was bigger than himself. God wants to do the same thing to you. It may be to reach one of your coworkers. It may be to start a Bible study with people who don't know the Lord. It may be to start a new area of the company that does all kinds of benevolence. I have no idea what God wants to do because I'm not God. Thank God. But I can tell you this. God is in control. And you can trust Him. And you can either endure it or you can enjoy it. But he is the source of satisfaction, not the job. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, how do you view your job? Are you enduring it? Are you enjoying it? 
If it's enduring it, then you do not have a heart of contentment. You have a heart issue, and that means it's time to repent. Believer, that means you need to say to God, God, forgive me. I don't have the right attitude. I, I, I have to come and accept my lot from you, meaning you're in control and I can trust you. I know last week you're here to enrich me, not rob me. And here this week, I'm here to trust you because you've got this under control. So Lord, thank you. And you come and you tell him that. Repent. Accept it. Then begin to ask for him to enable you to enjoy it so you can discover purpose in it to be his witness wherever you are. And then commit to pouring yourself in that job. <clears throat> to work hard with a humble attitude to serve those around you with the time you have left so he will get the glory. Tell him that. It's like God gave you that. Those of you Christians who are talking to God right now, that's awesome. I need to talk to one other group here, and that's those people who've identified yourself completely by your job. You've so poured yourself into there, you've had so much success at it, that you completely identify yourself by it, and it is your priority. I need to tell you when that job ends, so will your identity. Because you're drinking at a broken cistern. Why not realize today that job was given to you by God, not to identify you, but to glorify Him. And you need to adjust that this morning. And if you do, that job that means so much to you will take on a different meaning. And it will not be one of enslavement or performance, but of purpose and new identity. That you could walk away from it and do anything else and still be just as happy. Lord, right now as we're praying, we're coming to say one thing. Thank you. Thank you for the jobs we have. Thank you that you gave them to us. But Lord, forgive us where we've tried to identify ourselves by that job. Forgive us for that. It can't satisfy our thirst. It can't. It doesn't last. Once the job ends, the enjoyment ends. It has a very specific purpose. And that purpose is this. It's about you. We can't identify ourselves by it anymore. But Lord, forgive us for not thanking you. Really, it shows a lack of contentment, a heart issue where we don't trust you. We have to accept the fact that we have a lot in life. You've given us this. You've put us in this position. You want us here. And you're in control. And you know what's best. So Lord, enable us. Enable us to enjoy it. To find joy in it. To find purpose in it. And Lord, we will pour ourselves out serving it for you. Lord, I pray that we see nothing but joyful Christians. Whatever their job is, serving you, trusting you, walking in you. And I pray for new purpose to be your witnesses to declare your love, to show people your, the difference that you are, the difference you make, and we're able to share the life of Christ with all of those around us, Lord. We love you and we thank you. In your precious name we pray. God's people said, amen.